A very warm welcome to the inaugural session of the seventh edition of Saga, Science and Geopolitics of Arctic and Antarctic, which is a think tank for science policy and advocacy for the three poles. And organized by LIGHTS, Learning in Geography, Humanities, Technology and Science, in association with the Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India, the Royal Norwegian Embassy, National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, IITM, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Samhita Marine Polar Technologies, Embassy of Finland, Finland, Norin Kung, Climate Change Program, Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology, National Center for Coastal Research, National Institute of Ocean Technology, National Report, Remote Sensing Center, National Center for Seismology, Indian Meteorology Department, SO, the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services and Geological Survey of India. Ladies and gentlemen, LIGHTS is a non-profit organization registered under the Registrar of Societies Act 1860, has been endeavoring to provide a platform from 2011 onwards for polar stakeholders from the scientific, strategic, environmental, and social sciences fields to come together in an interdisciplinary manner to deliberate and evolve informed responses to issues and threats. Under the Lights Foundation, Saga has been institutionalized and structured as a multi-stakeholder, cross-sectoral think tank to bring together various research. Saga is committed to addressing one of the most challenging issues facing the global community and is the first of its kind to focus exclusively on the Arctic-Antarctic interface. It garners support from the government, academia and media belonging to the highest level of decision and policy formulation strata in India. Dr. Sulagna Chattopadhyay, President Saga, Editor-in-Chief, Geography and You which is a journal magazine focusing on climate change development and the environment in particular, being published since 2001. She has been working for nearly three decades in the field of climate change, polar studies, disaster management, and biodiversity. She has been involved in various research and outreach program and has co-authored two books, Climate Change and the White World, Science and Geopolitics of the White World. Arctic Antarctic Himalaya published by Springer along with six other books on varied topics. She's also founding member of LIGHTS and has been the convener of national and international conferences, seminars, notable being the Roundtable Conclave on Seas and Oceans Around India. Saga in 2011, 2012, 15, 17, 19 and 2020. She has been member of the National Biodiversity Authority, FIKI, Geospatial and award jury. So ladies and gentlemen, I would now invite Dr. Sulagna Chattopadhyay to kindly begin the proceedings of Saga 7 with a welcome address. Let's put our hands together to welcome. Good morning. Um, I am Sulagna, like I've been introduced <laughs> for a very long time. Sorry about that. Uh, so Saga has emerged as an idea from this one lone picture of an endless mass of fragmented white ice that I happened to see in a picture in the Ministry of Earth Sciences in 2008. And um, then I learned for the first time that our people are weathering these formidable terrains from far back as 1981, and uh, it was unbelievable for me at that point of time. Um, India's uh, scientific capacity has left an indelible mark on the polar realms. It has uh, proved to the world that we can, uh, you know, we can engage in cutting-edge science. Uh, global changes are uh, more likely to affect our populous coasts, our icy mountains, and uh, not to mention the need for reckoning, to be in the reckoning in these distant realms. And science doesn't happen in isolation, as we all know, because uh, what is happening in the polar regions are going to affect us. So therefore, it is important for us to understand. So in this backdrop, we developed something called SAGA, which is the acronym, as you know, for Science and Geopolitics of the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, so it is not only to do science, uh, engagement with science, but also to engage with uh, policy and to assist India in building. So one of these policies that we've uh, assisted in building was the Arctic policy. 
and we wanted to also open our arms to the civil society and to the scholars and to the universities to interest them in the future polar research programs. Um, so today, India is the only uh, think tank really on cryospheric issues, um, and we are here for nearly a decade and a half. Uh, so here is a brief summary. I just have uh, an infographic. The strength actually we draw from the people of Saga. So if you can just, uh, maybe if it's clear, this is from 2011 to 2023. Uh, we've had uh, more than 2,400 persons who have registered from over 145 organizations till date. And uh, we have done these uh, books, as you have seen, and we have also done a few popular journals. And uh, we have showcased more than 278 presentations. There have been 47 presentations on the Arctic, 77 on the Antarctic, 67 on the Indian Himalayan region, and uh, 32 on policy matters. And we've also worked on the oceans and monsoons and adaptations issues. So uh, these are the diverse areas that Saga has worked in, and they have been able to engage people. But as you have, you can understand and you can see that Saga actually interfaces two very diverse subject areas into one. One is science and the other is uh, policy or geopolitics. And it tries to interface between the two. And, um, uh, and as you know that in the polar region, science is the element, the key. You know, that is why we are there. And so it's important to understand from that context how to get further, what to do, how to help each other and grow better. I will just end with this line saying that um, it's an appeal to the global community to draw your attention once again to the deep connect between geopolitics and changing climate of the three poles. And we must take timely, ambitious, coordinated, and enduring actions to evade its worst impacts. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, after that brief introduction to Saga by Dr. Sulagna Chattopadhyay, I now have the privilege in inviting Dr. Rasik Ravindra for the welcome address. Dr. Ravindra is the current chairman of the Society of Earth Sciences of India, the senior vice president of Lights, and a member of the Research Advisory Committee of WIHG and NCPOR. Dr. Ravindra participated in Indian expedition to Antarctica in 1987-98 for the first time and subsequently led the 9th Antarctic expedition in 1989-1991. He led the first Indian expedition to the South Pole and the first Indian Arctic ex expedition. Dr. Ravindra was chairman of the DST constituted program monitoring Committees on Dynamics of Himalayan Glaciers, 2007-12, to and was appointed Chair Panikar Professor in October 2012 by Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India, and has many awards and accolades to his credit. And with those words of introduction, I invite Dr. Rasik Ravindra for his welcome address. Thank you, and very good morning. The dignitaries on the dais, Dr. Ravi Chandran, Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Shri Sanjay Verma, Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs. Ambassador Pankaj Saran, former Deputy National Security Advisor. His Excellency, Ambassador Hans Jacob Ferdinand Lund, Ambassador of Norway uh, to India. Our Professor N.C. Pant and Dr. Sulagna Chattopadhyay, Co-Chair and President of Saga. Delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's heartening to see galaxy of prominent persons scientists, academicians, directors, and head of the institutions, senior officers from Ministry of Earth Sciences, Ministry of External Affairs, Department of Science and Technology, various embassies in India, and young researchers present here to share the current state of our knowledge on the polar domain. I'm honored and privileged to welcome you all to the seventh conference of Saga on behalf of the organizing committee and on my own personal behalf. Uh, we have been uh, fortunate in having the blessings of Dr. Ravi Chandran, Secretary, Minister of Earth Sciences, as also his predecessors, such as Dr. Priyas Goel, Dr. Shalesh Nayak, and Dr. M. Rajivan, who have motivate, motivated us right from our beginning uh, since 2011. Your August presence is a source of inspiration to us, sirs. Honorable Sri Sanjay Varmaji and Ambassador Pankaj Saran, they have stared the Indian policy in the fields of polar regions. We are grateful for your kind presence, sir. 
We welcome His Excellency Ambassador Hans Jacob Friedland, Ambassador of Norway to India, Dr. Nellen Koch, Dr. Kenchi Muskwa, and Dr. Paul Dodd for their continued support uh, to SAGA. We value the long-standing support and the cooperation that we have been having between the Norway and SAGA. We heartily welcome all of you, sir. To Her Excellency Ambassador Tina Jotka, uh, Head of the ATCM Host Nation Secretariat at Finland, we express our grateful uh, gratitude for making it to SAGA in spite of her busy schedule. As most of you must be knowing, uh, Finland is going to host the 45th session of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Committee meeting at uh, Helsinki uh, just uh, one month after today. We also welcome participants from Australia, Canada, Iceland, Finland, Nepal, Sweden, UK, and United States, uh, whom you will be listening in the uh, deliberations over our uh, two days uh, meeting over here. We welcome senior officers uh, from MEA, MOES, uh, NGRI, Bits Pilani, Wada Institute of Himalayan Geology, DRDO, and several others without whose cooperation and participation uh, the Saga conference would not have been a success. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to see directors, uh, both current and past, of the leading earth science institutes uh, from India and abroad amidst us uh, today. It's a long list, but pardon me, and please allow me uh, to name uh, some of them. And in case I miss uh, some people, please uh, uh, forgive me. Uh, Dr. Sonam Wangchuk, founder of the SEMCOL from Ladakh. Dr. A. Krishnan, director IITM. Both of them are our plenary speakers, and you'll be listening to them shortly. Dr. Srinivas Kumar, director in COIS. Dr. R. P. Singh, director Indian Institute of Remote Sensing. Dr. O. P. Mishra, director National Center for Seismology. Dr. Thamban Maloth, director National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, that list uh, goes on. Dr. Ramana Murthy, Director NCCR. Dr. Nellan Koch, Director Norwegian Polar Institute. Major General B.K. Sharma, Head of the United Services Institute of India. Commander Divesh Lehri, Executive Director, National Maritime Foundation. Uh, Professor Tanu Jindal, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of MIT University. Dr. Shakil uh, Ramishu, Vice Chancellor of the Islamic University of Science and Technology, Kashmir. Dr. Veena Kumari, former chairperson, a National Biodiversity Authority, Dr. Sudhakar Rao, former director, CMLRI, Dr. Ajit Yagi, and Dr. K.J. Ramesh, former director general of IMD, Rear Admiral Amonti Khannaji, NSCS, Dr. V.M. Tiwari, Dr. Atmanan, Dr. Satish Shanoi, Dr. Rajan, all the leading earth scientists. And again, I repeat, if I have missed anybody, please forgive me. Last but importantly, I also welcome Dr. Dilawar Singh, CEO of Brilliance Group, our sponsors, Messrs. Norinko, uh, Messrs. Polo Technologies, and uh, Samhita Marines for being our partners in this endeavor. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for those warm words of welcome. And ladies and gentlemen, I would now request our distinguished dignitaries on the stage to kindly do the honors of releasing the Saga 7 book, The Future of Arctic Eyes and Indo-Pacific Connect, this book is being published as a pre-conference material for the benefit of all the participants and speakers. I think you all have been provided with a copy in your welcome delegate kit. So let's put our hands together for the release of the book. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest of honor, His Excellency Hans Jacob Friedelin, is presently the Norwegian ambassador to India. Before arriving in India, he was the director of UN policy in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has been the press spokesman for international development in the ministry, has served in Chile at Norwegian mission to the European Union in Brussels at the Norwegian mission to the United Nations in New York and has been the Norwegian representative to the Palestinian Authority. He has worked for 13 years in different capacities with conflict resolution in Africa. And ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome His Excellency for his address. Thank you very much. Secretary Verma, Secretary Ravichandran, Ambassador Saran, Dr. Rasik Ravindra, Saga team, 
dear colleagues and dear friends. Let me first thank Light for actually pulling together this conference again. And I would really acknowledge them for making this possible and getting focus on this area. And not just because it's emotional for me, because, well, I'm from Norway, this is our close area, and I, I'm one of them who are actually very strongly emotionally connected to it. Uh, and there I would like to, to quote uh, the Danish poll researchers who said, give me dogs, give me cold, give me ice, and you can have the rest. But it's not done for that reason. It's because in today's world of climate change, it's crucial that we actually understand the whole world, the whole globe. And it's essential that India, which actually defines itself as far away from any polar region, is also focusing on the poles, on the polar regions, are interacting with uh, the international community on the polar regions, and also are taking necessary action when it comes to climate change, also in this respect, having the knowledge that uh, is connected with uh, what's going on there. So that's why, dear friends, that I really feel at home here today. I feel at home because polar research is a corner, cornerstone of the bilateral relationship between Norway and India. And when we mention this to most Indians, they just stare uh, um, blank at me. Why? And then coming back to, yes, what the, the knowledge you get from the changes in the polar regions makes it possible for you to actually and predict what will happen on climate change, the movements of the monsoons, and the growth of the glaciers on the third pole in Himalaya. And therefore, I'm so glad that Norway's Polar Institute is working closely with India's National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, and it's so good to see Nalan Koch again coming to India. And that every nine uh, year, a number of scientists from India go to Svalbard, which is uh, Arctic Norway, to carry out their research. Our cooperation is based on mutual trust and common understanding of issues concerning the Arctic. I'm also glad to see that this year's Saga conference looks into the interconnections between polar um, and ocean issues. Again, we are an ocean nation, completely dependent on the oceans. And through sustainable management, ocean resources Norway has emerged from a society of fishermen and seafaring traders to a blue economy where 80% of exports come from the blue element. And realizing the importance of ocean, Norway and India have set up a task force on blue economy for sustainable development, which I chair together with Secretary Ravi Chandran. And under the task force, we have made great strides toward promoting integrated ocean management and tackling marine pollution through several joint projects. Our industries are partnering up to build zero emission ships and develop deep ocean technology. And I, again, good to see, see from friends here from, from NIOT and IOT Madras and other institutions who are working on, on this. Dear friends, I feel at home because the meeting will have a particular focus on climate change as opposed to warming faster than the rest of the planet. And we live close to the North Pole. As temperatures are rising, we realize the importance of cold to which resource-based and our way of living. And just a small personal note there, because as I told them, I'm completely dedic dedicated to cold and the snow and the ice. And when I was a teenager, I could take on my skis and have 130 days of skiing in, um, in actually the forest north of Oslo. Today we're down to 90, and, it's, and actually it's diminishing in, um, even more, which actually a fundamental part of my identity is disappearing. Um, so many of the lessons learned in Norway's blue economy comes from the Arctic, where ecosystems are fragile and extra care is needed when extracting resources. And dear friends, I feel at home here because this conference has significance for Norway, as in two weeks from now, we're taking over the chairship of the Arctic Council. 
And in a statement a few days ago, our foreign minister emphasized that we will work to ensure that Arctic Council remains the leading international forum for Arctic issues. And actually, in, in direct speak, speech, that actually the Ukraine war will not sink this extremely important forum for actually discussing Arctic issues. She also stressed upon that the change in Arctic is a global challenge that we must address together. Through four priority topics, the oceans, climate and environment, sustainable economic development and people in the north, Norway will continue to pursue the long-term approach taken by the Council that is to ensure a vibrant and sustainable Arctic region. Later during the, this session, the Norway's senior uh, Arctic official will have a recorded message about Norway's plans for the Council's future. I believe Norway's priorities align well with emphasis on research, sustainability, and combating climate change in India's Arctic policy. For more than 25 years, the Arctic Council has been a linchpin of Arctic cooperation. In the Council in 2004 brought out the first insight into the impact of climate change on nature and society in the Arctic. And we live in an extraordinary, difficult time in global geopolitics. However, I believe we cannot afford to forget the long-term challenges focusing the Arctic. And therefore, also again, I'm happy that we gathered here today to discuss it also here in New Delhi. And Norway appreciates its partnership with India in this regard. Because, as I said, the partnership with India is, well, I said we have a close cooperation on uh, the Arctic, one well, of the polar regions with India. Uh, but it's not only a focus on Arctic, which is close to home for us, but we're also going to discuss about the Antarctic, which is also close to our heart. And we also have some, a lot of which I spent a lot of time in the ice and the cold. As consultative parties to the Antarctic Treaty and members of Commission of the, for the Conservation of Marine Living Resources, Norway and India have common interest in, in the international cooperation. Uh, on the continent. India's Antarctic research station Maitri is not far from Norway's research station Troll. We are th thus well placed for scientific collaboration in the region. And an example of an Indian Norwegian research projects co-funded by Research Council of Norway and Ministry of Earth Science investigated how the coastal area of the Antarctic ice sheet has changed in the last several millennia. Close cooperation is key to increased interest and knowledge about this very special continent and its management regime. In June, the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting takes place in Helsinki, Finland. I'm happy to see my Finnish colleagues here. And the year after, it's India's turn to host this important meeting. And we hope that you will build on the Helsinki meeting and ensure that climate change is held high on the agenda next year as well. Friends, the polar areas are neither a museum, not just an icy wilderness. Our lives and our economy are dependent on them, and we must act to protect them. And I wish you the best luck with this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest, Sri Sanjay Verma, assumed the Secretary West post at Ministry of External Affairs in 2022. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1990, and his overseas assign assignments have included being ambassador to Spain and Andorra, ambassador to Ethiopia, Djibouti, and the African Union Council General, Dubai, Councillor, Economic and Commercial, Indian Embassy, Beijing, Spokesperson and Councillor, Press Information and Culture, Indian Embassy, Kathmandu, Second Secretary, Press and Political, Indian Embassy, Manila, and Economic and Commercial Officer, Hong Kong. Sri Verma's assignments at the MEA have included the China Desk 8, OSD, to the Spokesperson, Joint Secretary, DG, Energy Security, and Chief of Protocol. And ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome our special guest, Sri Sanjay Verma, for his address. Secretary Dr. Ravi Chandran, Ambassador of Norway, Ambassador of Finland, Ambassador Pankaj Saran, Professor Pant, 
डॉक्टर एस एक रविंद्र डॉक्टर सुलग्न एंड आई मस्ट एंड आई आई नीड टू गेट दिस ऑफ माई चेस्ट इज दैट आई थिंक द स्टेक होल्डर्स एंड द डिग्नेटरीज इन द ऑडियंस आई थिंक द सब्सटैंशियल नेचर ऑफ योर पर्सनैलिटीज इज वन ऑफ दो रेयर ओकेजन्स वेयर I think uh, the worth of the dais and uh, the floor is equal. So, a very speci- special greetings to all of you. Thank you for coming. We appreciate the efforts of uh, science and geopolitics of Arctic and Antarctic saga for their work on the Arctic and the Antarctic. It is noteworthy mm-hmm. that this conference covers several cross-cutting aspects of the polar region with a particular focus on the Arctic and the Indo-Pacific. It's a pleasure to share my thoughts with you. The IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in the changing climate suggests that since the mid 20th century the shrinking cryosphere in the Arctic and high, high mountain areas has led to the predominantly negative impact on food security, water resources, livelihoods, health, infrastructure, transportation, tourism as well as culture of the human societies particularly for indigenous peoples the region is warming 3 to 4 times faster than the global average and this unprecedented atmospherics has resulted into a new ocean the arctic ocean the arctic region of 20 million square kilometers clearly influences the earth's ecosystem atmospherics oceanography and the ecological cycles if the freezer breaks down you may sub optimally still use your refrigerator but a melting arctic could be apocalyptic not notwithstanding spatial distances melting arctic ice impacts the indian monsoon which bears repetition accounts for 70% of our rains understanding this connection is critical for india for it impacts 1/5 of humanity india has had a presence in the arctic since 2007 including a research station we are one of the 13 nations with observer status in the arctic council since 2013 our arctic policy emphasizes scientific research and cooperation environmental protection economic and human development transportation and connectivity the six pillars of our arctic policy needs a focused multi stakeholder approach involving not just the government entities but also research institutions think tanks universities and the private sector arctic research can help india scientific community study global warming climate changes uneven weather patterns and draw comparison to glacial behavior especially in the himalayas which are roughly one fourth the size of the arctic region as a seafaring nation the arctic should be on our dashboard including for merchant shipping reasons the northern sea route has the potential to cut costs and boost connectivity significantly The Arctic has the potential to open up new economic opportunities like energy and resource exploration, food security and tourism. Yes, you can picture Indian tourists in the Arctic like the movie Dil Dhadakne Do. The importance of capacity building in the area of polar research is a given. We are looking to expand the cooperation along with the National Center for Polar Research and other scientific institutions in India. Further for instance the Arctic University of Norway is working on new areas such as large ice masses and their role in global carbon accounting such areas would be of great interest to a scientific fraternity India has been working with some arctic member states in scientific research commerce and connectivity during the second india nordic summit in may 2022 prime minister modi no- noted that india's arctic policy provides a good framework for expansion of india nordic cooperation in the arctic region our bilateral relations with all countries in the region are robust ladies and gentlemen now a few words on the indo pacific region ever since prime minister modi announced the indo pacific oceans initiative at the east asia summit in 2019 India has taken the lead in building cooperation in the region around maritime security, maritime ecology, marine resources, capacity building and resource sharing, disaster risk reduction and management, science technology, academic cooperation and trade connectivity along with maritime transport. The overlap with the focus areas of the Arctic Council is obvious. 
Under the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, India has been leading on the maritime security and disaster risk reduction pillars. Japan, another Asian observer to the Arctic Council, is a lead partner on the connectivity pillar of IPOI. Our experience with IPOI can be relevant for the Arctic region as well. For instance, we are now moving towards greater interoperability on HDR with common guidelines and SOPs on search and rescue. We are discussing common approaches to combating marine pollution and marine plastics. These are relevant for the Arctic region as well. We will continue to look for synergies between such initiatives to maximize outcomes. Friends, India has been upfront in drawing the attention and involvement of like-minded partners and friends to the Indo-Pacific region before it becomes a black hole where free, open, inclusive and peaceful rule-based international order disappears. The weather up north is different, but the geostrategic attractions are a deja vu. After COVID-19, the Arctic Council was paralyzed by the geopolitics of the Ukrainian conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, science diplomacy is a currency for the Arctic region, but the social science of real politics is often the central banker. I congratulate Norway on its upcoming chairship of the Arctic Council sometime next week and hope that Norway's touch will enable the Council. We look forward to working together with Oslo in reactivating our partnerships in the region. In closing, I congratulate Saga and its partners for making this conference possible and wish the proceedings a purposeful success. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished guest today, His Excellency Ambassador Pankaj Sarun, is the convener of NatStart, a Delhi-based independent center for research on strategic and security issues, and a commentator and consultant on security and strategic issues. He is a former diplomat with four decades of experience in foreign, strategic, and national security affairs. Ambassador Sarun has served in different capacities within the Prime Minister's office, the NC. NSCS, the MEA, and Indian Missions Abroad. He has served as Ambassador of India to Russia, High Commissioner to Bangladesh, and Head of the Northern Division in the Ministry of External Affairs, dealing with Nepal and Bhutan. From 2018 to 21, served as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Affairs, dealing with regional and global strategy formulation, maritime security, Arctic affairs, and India's neighborhood. He has written for the Times of India, Hindustan Times, and the Economic Times, among other newspapers and journals. And ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome His Excellency for his address. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here today. I want to begin uh, my remarks by thanking uh, Sulagna and the other office bearers for inviting me today for this session. Um, I want to extend my best wishes to the dignitaries on the stage, to members of the audience, and just to share uh, a few thoughts with you, um, particularly to the Indian audience about uh, the Arctic and why uh, this conference is relevant uh, to us. Uh, firstly, some uh, uh, time frame, uh, uh, some contextual uh, uh, figures which will set uh, the perspective. Uh, 2023 also happens to be uh, the 10th anniversary of India's observership to the Arctic Council. And it is also the 15th year of the establishment of our research station in Himadri in uh, Norway. So in, in a sense, this year actually, is rather uh, significant uh, insofar as India is concerned. So this conference, therefore, is also more significant than otherwise would be. Uh, as you all know, uh, in 2022, um, India announced its Arctic policy. Uh, but I would like to, uh, before talking about the policy, take this opportunity to uh, share and to also join everyone else in recognizing and paying great tribute to the Indian scientific community, which has quietly 
over the years contributed to the Indian research effort in both the poles. And this has been done without much fanfare, out of the headlines, but they have been at it starting from very humble beginnings, extremely small budget, very limited manpower, and we have seen how in the government the institutional arrangements evolved over time, starting from a small department of ocean development a few decades ago to a full-fledged Ministry of Earth Sciences, how the institute in Goa has grown in its stature, and how other institutions have come up. Similarly, the study of the Arctic and the Antarctic in Indian universities has actually also grown. And so we have now, more than before, a body of researchers uh, and expertise in India about the Arctic and, of course, uh, the Antarctic. And I feel that as an Indian, this is a great achievement uh, for all of us. Because the normal and rightful reaction is, uh, what does India have to do with the Arctic or with the poles? And so the study of the poles was very narrowly limited to a narrow set of people, and the connection between India and the poles was not readily understood. So in that context, I would like to also take this opportunity to congratulate Saga for being the lone voice in propagating the importance of the poles uh, over, over the years. And today, I believe it's their seventh conference, and it just shows how perseverance and uh, uh, a purposeful uh, vision and, uh, and, and mandate uh, can contribute to uh, socializing a very, very important uh, subject. So I think we, we should actually be grateful to Saga for, for doing this all alone. Of course, they can't do this alone without the support of uh, the government. And therefore, it's very encouraging to see both the Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Earth Sciences and so many scientists from the government present here today to participate and to support Saga. And institutions and NGOs like Saga could actually become um, very useful resource, resources intellectually and otherwise to policy makers in the government. Um, of course, the, uh, the reasons why uh, the study of the polls is important to India has been uh, outlined, and I am sure in the next two days this is going to be examined in great depth uh, from all dimensions. But clearly, uh, climate uh, and global warming is perhaps <clears throat> the most important uh, aspect of the study. And in here, uh, India is really uh, facing a very serious challenge, which is going to grow over time. And it is essential for us as a country to be able to understand every single dimension of climate change and every single causative factor that impacts Indian agriculture, Indian food security, the Indian monsoon pattern, what happens in the Indian Ocean, what happens in the glaciers in the Himalayas. These are all interlinked and it will be very short-sighted for us if we do not open our minds and understand the linkages that exist, even though it may appear that it is far away in terms of geography uh, from, uh, from India. Of course, uh, a saga, and I see from the title and the agenda, is also trying something very interesting. They are trying to bring together the two universes of science and geopolitics into the study of the Arctic region. And I think that, again, is a very um, unique approach to the subject, because you cannot divorce one from the other. And uh, I would, of course, like to congratulate Norway for 
uh, assuming very shortly the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, it, is, it is actually we should, um, as Indians, I think it is important for us to uh, be proud of the fact that we were one of the very few countries that got observership status to the Arctic Council in uh, 2013 and we were re-elected again. And we are only one of four Asian countries who have this privilege, the others being, of course, China, Korea, and Singapore. So as an observer, the question which we should ask ourselves is, what can we contribute to the work of the Council? How can we bring whatever strengths we have to the functioning of the Council? And I think we have repeatedly said at all official levels that India will participate positively and constructively in the functioning of the Council, and which is why the enunciation of our Arctic policy in 2022 was a very, very significant and a major step. And this is still work in progress in terms of how to implement the policy. And I would only um, hope that organizations like Saga can bring together the community of researchers across the length and breadth of India to create a good pool of talent who can understand the Arctic in all its myriad dimensions and take this and actually help the government to implement this policy, which, if you have read it, uh, is, is, is actually geared towards uh, a, a cross-cutting participatory effort by all sections of Indian society, and it also has a major element of uh, international cooperation on how and why India should be engaged much, much more with all the institutions uh, related to the poles, not just the council, but there are economic and so many other civil society uh, institutions. So, uh, so this is all a part and parcel of, I would say, the implementation phase of the Arctic policy. Now that you have the base, it is time for all of us to actually participate in making it a successful uh, implementable charter uh, so that we can see and contribute fully uh, as an observer to, to the Council. Insofar as the geopolitics is concerned, obviously the events of last year have been unfortunate and have also had an impact on the Arctic Council. But as an Indian, we hope that these differences can be resolved and the Arctic should never be a region for geopolitical or geostrategic contestation between major powers. And it should actually remain an area and a region for cooperation for the benefit of all humanity. So um, with these words, I would just like to once again uh, congratulate Saga for this initiative and wish the conference all success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your kind words. And ladies and gentlemen, I now have the proud privilege of introducing our honorable chief guest, Dr. M. Ravi Chandran. He is the Secretary of Ministry of Earth Sciences, New Delhi. He was the director of NCPOR Goa from 2016 to 21. He has worked as a scientist of IITM in atmospheric sciences, NIOT in ocean observing systems, marine meteorology, and INCOIS in the ocean observing system and ocean modeling. His research interests include atmospheric physics and ocean dynamics, marine meteorology and air-sea interaction, ocean observing systems, and ocean modeling. And ladies and gentlemen, with those words of introduction, I have the proud privilege in inviting Honorable Chief Guest for the inaugural address. Let's put our hands together to welcome. Sri Sanjay Verma, Secretary West Ministry of External Affairs, His Excellency Hans Jakob Frederin, Ambassador of Norway to India, Ambassador Pankaj Sharan, former Deputy NSA, Ambassador of Finland, Dr. Rasay Kravindra, former Director NCPOR, Professor N.C. Pant, Dr. Sulakna, 
Dr. Goyal and Dr. Rajivan, former secretaries of MOAS, and many other luminaries are sitting in front, delegates, invitees, colleagues, and friends. A very good morning to all of you, and it is my great pleasure to be here with you all to participate in the Saga 7. First and foremost, I thank uh, Light for organizing Saga 7. I think with so many luminaries, especially I could see many ambassadors, many past secretaries and present secretaries and maybe future secretaries <laughs> and also the past directors, present directors, future directors, so many scientists and policy makers all put together. You brought everybody here and thank you very much for bringing all together. Of course, uh, it is very difficult task now in front of all three ambassadors, whatever I thought to speak, all three ambassadors have spoke. <laughs> I don't know what to speak now. It is very challenging time at the uh, last minute. Of course, having said that, you all know that uh, the polar regions are the first and foremost to response to the climate change. The climate change is happening uh, very fast, rapidly. Of course, in the Arctic region, it is uh, two times, three times, now they are telling four times. Of course, the reference year is important. Of course, in many literature, you can see that sometimes three times, sometimes four times of the global mean. Of course, there is an increase in air temperature in the Arctic, as well as uh, decrease in sea ice extent, and the loss of multi-sea ice, uh, 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 multi-year sea ice, then increased upper ocean heat content as well as the freshwater content is going on increasing in the Arctic and also acidifications and the ecosystem is shifting very rapidly in the Arctic and also accelerated Greenland ice sheet melting, warming permafrost and much more is happening. Of course, these are the things happening in the Arctic and similarly there are something happening in the Antarctic too, in the uh, Himalaya and the ocean also warming much faster. I personally feel that in Indian perspective, of course in many everybody's things, there are four aspects it is very important why we are in Arctic. Number one, of course, uh, science of climate change. What is happening in the Arctic, it is not only local, but also it global. It impacts, it's uh, happening everywhere. And very important thing is, of course, already mentioned by ambassadors uh, saying that the monsoon. What is this monsoon? Actually, if you all see that recently our scientists uh, revealed the sea ice decreasing, that means the ocean area is increasing in the Arctic. It is creating basically the extreme rainfall is increasing in India, not only India, in Asian countries, extreme rainfall. Whereas the sort, maybe the light rainfalls are decreasing. It is very well demonstrated because of uh, Arctic sea ice and other things. In turn, the heavy precipitation is increasing in our region in the uh, extreme rainfall and it is also produced a lot of uh, latent heat release and again it goes back to Arctic. Again it is in Arctic is further warming and further warming then again it is become the uh, like a feedback mechanism so it is accelerating much more in the Arctic. And then we are also facing consequences. So there is atmospheric teleconnections very strong and it is uh, going on faster scale. Not only that, but also the ocean tunnel also influencing. Maybe the Greenland ice sheet melting and the sea level is also increasing. And because of that, you know that in Indian Ocean is a landlocked countries even small change in the volume of water and thermal expansion is added because the Indian Ocean is uh, much faster warming than other oceans. So we feel more impact in the Indian Ocean. When you have more impact on the Indian Ocean, then al also you have a more convective activities in the tropical belt, especially MJO and other things. That in turn produced a lot of heat and it propagate to the poles, both poles not only for Arctic, but also Antarctic, then the ice sheets again, ice sheets and sea ice is warming much faster. So there is a lot of connection in terms of uh, impact in the Arctic as well as the tropics. So that is the number one, that is the climate change 
and Arctic influence in local as well as remote. That is the first point. The second point, as you already mentioned, that it is a sea route. The sea route is a changing. Uh, of course, the new openings will be coming out. Yes, some benefits. Maybe the opening navigation route and new connection will bring out some cutting cost in some places, shipping route and other things, because most of the uh, materials is transported through ship route. 90% at least it is transported through ship route. And there is an economical uh, things will change. And then the shipping corridor, the economic shipping corridor will change. In that reason, I think there are a lot of change will happen, not only for the, uh, the what is called the uh, shipping uh, corridor economics, but also the marine ecosystem changes also will happen. In because of the more shipping route in the Arctic, then what will happen? Some of the ecosystem degradation, and then maybe oil leaks and other things can happen in the Arctic. In that connection, of course, you all know that now Indian Ocean is the main corridor for ship route, but that will be reduced. Then what will be the impact of this reduction in ship route in the Indian Ocean? So when increase in the Arctic side, so that we need to look at it. What is the impact? whether is there any significant impact in both the economic as well as the strategic that we need to look at it closely. That is number second. And number three is I personally feel that the resources. Of course, the resource availability on the Arctic, uh, both uh, uh, what is called oils and metals and whether many things are free to access by others. So uh, that will degrade again the uh, ocean influence that means it will be uh, creating a lot of uh, uh, what is called though the economic benefit will be there but the ecosystem will again degrade and most of the thawing permafrost also it will be erosions as well as to increase the many other challenges and the not only non-living resources but also living resources like the fisheries also will be ecosystem will enhance maybe the mid-latitude species may be migrated towards the polar regions and then the ecosystem will grow much faster. So the more and more economic activities will happen in the Arctic. If it has happened, then how it will be uh, uh, ecosystem will respond. That is a different dimension we need to look at it. Of course, also we will be, uh, uh, there will be more and more tourism because the seasonal, of course, the uh, what is called the access to the port and longer uh, seas and season for the different area in the Arctic will enhance the Arctic tourism and that also will uh, hamper the system. And the last final one is, of course, uh, geopolitics. I think uh, Arctic, of course, uh, as mentioned by earlier, it is to be the Arctic should be used as a cooperation and collectiveness, togetherness and other things rather than the diversification. I think this entire things, maybe the science is the backbone for all the things, not for economic activities and all other things. The science is a backbone for bringing, bringing all the togetherness uh, in the name of Arctic. I am sure this particular, uh, uh, what is called, uh, last two years we had a lot of uh, difficulty in terms of Arctic Council, many other activities were stalled, but now I personally feel that I'm happy that uh, Norway is taking up very soon in two weeks as a chairmanship and there will be a lot of uh, more and more Arctic Council activities as well as the other activities will start so that the uh, discussion and collaboration and cooperate in Arctic things will happen. Of course, as I already mentioned by Indian Arctic policy, what is the uh, six pillars uh, uh, I think our Secretary West has already mentioned. But the main objective is in the Arctic policy, in Indian Arctic policy, is mainly to enhance cooperation. It is not only science and policies and economic and social. All the areas we need to have an enhanced cooperation. That is the number first objective of our Arctic policy. And also we need to work on harmonize with our Indian Arctic policy. We have stipulated that uh, we have to have a harmonize with the third pole because third pole Himalaya is depend, uh, 1.9 billion people are dependent on the Himalaya. So how it is uh, changing because of the climate change, what is the connection between the other poles and how it is evolving over the period. And we don't know even other places, we know at least to what is the total volume of water available in Arctic and Antarctic roughly. 
But in Himalaya, we don't know what is the volume of water is available because area only available, even depth we don't know. So we have to be much more worry about this third pole and its uh, consequences of the climate change. And also we need to contribute much more in the understanding the Arctic region because it is not understood full entirely, maybe the solid earth and liquid ocean and gaseous atmosphere, all the three regions we need to have more and more understanding for that we need to have a more and more observation both in situ as well as uh, satellite based observations. Of course we need to, we have uh, put forth there is a combating climate change and also how to protect the environment and what are the ways and means to mitigate the things in the Arctic as well as in other places. That is a major objective we have put forth in the Arctic policy and of course we have especially mentioned that about the advanced study in Arctic region and more and more universities in the Indian universities come out with the Arctic area of type of research in terms of capacity building and other things. These are the some of the areas which we have uh, uh, thought about in the Arctic. Of course, when you are talking about Arctic, of course, the counterpart in Antarctic also a lot of, of course, it is a continent of science and uh, though it is not that traumatic changes is happening in the Antarctic like Arctic, but there are it is a silent killer type. It is a very, it is having long memory than the Arctic, so it is able to uh, withstand some of the energy, so it is holding, but we don't know what will happen very soon. So there also we need to have a two main focus. One is the climate change, and other one is again the geopolitics of uh, Antarctic. And of course, I last one is the Himalaya and the ocean. Of course, Himalayan region is, it is also warming continuously compared to in global average it is going much more than the global average and the glaciers and permafrost are melting rapidly in the recent years and also shrinking and melting glaciers and also expan expansion of glaciers lakes are increasing and there are very risk and hazards are happening in around uh, Himalaya especially because of the globe so this is a very serious problem is happening so we need to invest more and more our enhanced monitoring network, not only in the all the three poles, but also in the ocean. And we need to strengthen our modeling effort because the modeling effort, when compared to other regions, the Arctic and Antarctic modeling things, which means feature prediction is very, very poor when compared to other regions. So we need to understand much, much better for that. We need to have more knowledge generation and understand possible impacts of what are the cryospheric changes is happening. We need to have an effective adaptive and a mitigation strategy as well to avoid the risk and uncertainties and the regional cooperation and also the global cooperation is important. Of course, this title of this particular saga, it is almost, uh, it is in coincidence with uh, our uh, G20 presidency. Of course, we are always telling that um, one earth, one family, one future. So under that, we always see that one Earth, of course, it is also one ocean, one earth, and maybe one family and feature. So I think it is a subset of our presidency. I am sure that in the last, uh, this decade, mainly 2021 to 2030, most of the decade, it is in UN and other bodies announced a decade of the ocean, decade of the ecosystem, many of the things are there. But I personally feel that in 2040s, it will be the decade of maybe the polar decade mainly because in 2040s in early early 40s summer sea ice will not be there so there will be a uh, big changes and 2048 antarctic treaty is going to be end and there are what will happen in the himalayan glaciers uh, it is a it is also question mark so it is a very in both science as well as strategic as well as the future things which you need to think about so that in 2040 will be the polar lot of complexity will arrive so we need to plan our strategy in that connection i think it is important we should have a i think india should have not only arctic policy polar strategy as well as polar policy in that connection so i think we need to evolve in that direction i think in that direction this saga type of conference and other things will be very useful to bring out some of the concrete ideas and other things and i thank you all for coming and thank you saga for organizing this one i wish this conference and fruitful discussion uh, will emerge will provide much more recommendation for the 
uh, future directions of uh, India, obviously. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for that insightful inaugural address. Ladies and gentlemen, we have on the dais with us Professor N.C. Pant, who is a geologist by profession, has made significant contributions in establishing the extension of the East African origin in East Antarctica, described high pressure metamorphism from Indian Archean Creton, applied innovative and uncommon application of electroprobe microanalysis for estimating the bulk composition of selected microdomains, inferring sub ice geology of East Antarctic Shield from proximal marine sediments and many others. He is involved in Indian Antarctic activities for the past three and a half decades, and out of which 10 years have been in management activities of the science program of Indian Arctic expeditions. And I would like to invite you, sir, for the concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Thank you. Some altitudinal adjustments <laughs> following Dr. Ravi Chandran. Uh, Actually, I don't have to say much, uh, essentially because uh, the president, the chairman, uh, Dr. Rasik Ravindra, has very elucid, in an elucid way, expressed thanks to everyone. However, I begin by uh, looking at the dignitaries here, Dr. Ravi Chandran, Secretary, Ministry of Earth Science, Shri, uh, the Secretary West, sorry, just one second. Shri Sanjay Verma, Secretary West, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Hans Jacob Fridland, Ambassador of Norway to India, Ambassador Pankaj Saran, uh, Dr. Rasik Ravindra and Sulekna ji. The effort to have this conference, which I will like to call a rainbow conference. And many, uh, many of us actually feel that this kind of conference is not a serious academic conference in the sense that it has too many different widely varying subjects. But when we look at actually the way the polar domain needs to be considered, possibly the requirement is to have an inclusion of people from, in terms of science from hydrosphere, biosphere, cryosphere, and to use another phrase, anthrosphere. Anthroposphere will be correct. The anthroposphere essentially uh, includes all kinds of human influences, and they could be cultural, they are social, economic, etc. And actually when we look at the cryosphere domain, the past records, we find very strong influences of Anthropocene. We, call, we, start, we started calling it Anthropocene, a, a topic which will be later discussed also. There is also a question, there is a sizable young population sitting here who what Dr. Ravi Chandan mentioned, 2040 and beyond, will be what? In our positions. And some of them ask as to why the similar kind of science to being done in polar domains is important. And the reason many of us who have actually worked, Kenny is sitting here, is that whatever we are doing is actually extremely inaccurate in many sense. We don't know the errors of what we are actually doing. The errors could be significant and that is the reason we do not know what are the tipping points of many of the systems which will affect 
us if the polar domains are significantly changed. Again, some of the young students ask why it's positive Greenland ice disappears, we will have a lot of land which is available to us, yes. But we even don't know that whether it is a positive development or a negative de development. Or if it is a negative development, to what extent in which senses it can make the difference. And therefore, the Mirite studies which are needed are required to be done, are required to be continued by different kind of uh, disciplines. And thus, the rainbow kind of conference which this Saga 7 is essential. It's in, in, in some sense, at least in India, it is a unique or a singular effort. And even to come to this, I think the 10 to 12 years of Saga has taken so that we find this focus now. And actually how do we proceed from this is also not very clear to us. I'm sorry, I'm not making as definitive statement as most of us think we may be, but act, there is a lot of indecisiveness about things to progress. And for that, we believe that Saga can provide a platform or is providing a platform. Not at the moment, it's only a platform which is uh, assembled after a long time and it's not really leading to what, what could be envisaged or what could be done. That is, it is not providing right uh, enough of the policy inputs, enough of the science inputs. Saga itself is not doing science. It is actually bringing together in this rainbow the different colors. And ultimately, whether the, the collection of colors leads to white light or not is what the Saga ultimately aims at. There are two components of this. One is that academic component wherein what we have tried to do in this time is to bring in people as diverse as legal legal fields as diverse as cost accounting of mid accounting cost accounting in climate change context besides of course the hydrosphere biosphere and geosphere studies so we hope that after two days we will be able to distill some insights from this motley data at the moment and arrive at some things which can lead to an input which is useful in, uh, in the right polar context. And the second aspect is that of, as I said, the young people. Are we, maybe Saga is in, at that stage where it can provide that awareness to a much larger audience which is of younger people to whom the issues of polar change matter most. So therefore, the vote of thank goes actually besides the important people sitting here to, the, to these experts who represent these diverse fields and have considered it's significant enough to come and contribute. The vote of thank also goes to the people who are joined with us, either directly sitting here or virtually. They are sparing their time and considering that it is important enough to be part of this discourse. The vote of thank goes to the young people who are there because it is very important for them to be part of it because it matters most to them. Most of us will not be there when there could be, you know, bad things happening because of what is happening in polar domains. And the vote of thank also goes to the sponsors who will be actually detailed, mentioned later on, I hope, I believe in the valediction, which is allowing us to be comfortable and talking with each other in this setting. The word of thank also goes 
to a small team of core group led by i can see she is also young uh, dr sulagna chatopadhyay and uh, who made all this possible i might have of course missed many which you can ascribe to being old enough a retired person can always take records in that so i believe that at the end of two days we will have something to show for and uh, with that words we i finish thank you so much